Geeks, a weekly geeky blog. I am your host and writer behind 99geek.ca, Andrew Getzi. As primarily a fiction writer, releasing chapters of my books in weekly chunks on my Patreon, like episodes of TV shows when I'm trying not to make when I'm not trying to make ends meet, when I'm trying not to make ends meet, like I'm just throwing my money away. Take it. Just take it. I want to starve. Um, anyway. <laughs> when I am, I don't even know where I am anymore. What am I doing? Who am I? Um, when I'm not trying to make ends meet in what feels like a poverty nightmare, I wanted my brand, 99% Geek, to offer more than just my writing, pulling from my many interests and passions. I don't have much to offer in the way of talent besides my writing, but I'm passionate about pop culture and try to keep myself as up-to-date on politics, science, and art as I can. Being a huge TV nerd, I run down the best shows of the week, go over all the major news headlines for people who have maybe gotten too tired to follow regular news, breaking it down and explaining it for people who might feel unable to follow along, and before anything else, I spotlight something cool and geeky for the week. Remember, you can follow along by going to patreon.com slash 99geek. This is Geekly Weekly number uh, 94 for Friday, April 16th. And this week's highlight is zombies. I hope uh, you have been um, honoring your zombies in your life. Uh, zombies are precious to all of us and a valuable commodity in our world. No. Um, honestly, I'm kind of wishing that I'd not paired Rick and Morty alongside Lock and Key last week. I could have talked about how great Lock and Key was last week. Finally finished it, by the way. It was great. Loved it. Can't wait for season two. I especially um, thought the ending was was fantastic. Like, I, I think uh, last week when I was talking about it, I mentioned that it sagged a little in the middle. Um, I felt it definitely picked up again uh, near the end, and uh, I enjoyed the ending, and there were some cool twists, and uh, I liked the, the places that remained faithful to the uh, comic book, and I definitely think everybody should check it out, Lock and Key amazing but then also um i talked about rick and morty and kind of wished i didn't because if i didn't then i could gush about it this week and how amazing it's been uh, i just watched the season two episode about getting swifty and it is absolutely transcendent it is uh, the some of the greatest 20 minutes of my life <laughs> we're, we're spent watching that episode um so if you don't watch rick and morty yet um i know uh, a little bit later i mentioned that uh, both falcon and Winter Soldier, as well as uh, Invincible, are must-watch television right now. You must be watching those shows. If you're not, I don't know what's wrong with you. You shouldn't be listening to this. You should be watching those shows. Um, but I would put Rick and Morty into that as well. I don't know what was wrong with me that it's taking me so long to get into this show because it is transcendently good. It is just, it is on, on another level of absurd. And uh, I just like absurd humor, I guess. It's like... It's unexplainable, is what it is. It's swifty, is what it is. So yeah. Um, but so what about zombies? Well, zombies was a quick burning fad over 10 years ago that still continues to be relevant today, is uh, what you should know. I guess zombies have been around since like the 60s, um, or even before that. I mean, how long have... Because I mean, they were popular even so far as like, Comic books, I think, back in, like, what, the 30s and things like that? Um, early zombie comics. Let's see how far back this goes. No, oh, that's Walking Dead. We were aware of that. Uh, first appearance, Menace, number five. Oh, I think that's a character called Zombie. Some dude named Zombie. Created by Stan Lee, I think I mentioned. Wow. He just creates all the people. Cool. So at least before 1953, we can know that for sure. Uh, yeah, who knows? But yeah, so my point is zombies been around for a very long time. Um, and if you want to get started with zombies, I honestly... Probably not the best person to ask such a question to. Um, I would probably suggest Walking Dead uh, at this point. There's zombie properties out there for everyone, but with the end of The Walking Dead, beginning to appear The Walking Dead and the Resident Evil online reveal this week, I thought it might be a good time just to talk about zombies for a while. So if you have lots of time on your hands, you should probably just watch The Walking Dead and its 17 seasons of uh, Between The Walking Dead, The Fear of The Walking Dead, that other show that sucked, um, <laughs> which is just great. Uh, this is how I saw you on a show. 
Um, some might point to Fear the Walking Dead as being the better, the best version of the show, and and I think some people have even given up on watching The Walking Dead and only watch Fear the Walking Dead. To be honest, there is not a season of any of the shows that uh, doesn't have strong points and weak points. Um, all three shows have long stretches of ups and downs. It's a show about the low burn, about really delving into characters and what makes them tick and who they are, and really letting you get to know them before killing them off shockingly without warning. It's a roller coaster ride of a show, with periods of quiet and boredom, and then sudden moments of insanity. And sometimes the quiet moments are the most interesting parts, and the violence is what gets boring. The show is very all over the place, and there's many things to different people, and if you've never watched it, it might be worth giving it a chance, especially if you have a lot of time on your hands. If you don't have a lot of time on your hands, it's absolutely alright though, because there are so many other ways to experience zombies out there. Uh, if you're looking for a more comedic take, there's always Zombie Land 1 and 2. I personally love the first movie, it's one of my favorite movies of all time, and I think everyone should watch it at least once. It's, uh, it's a great comedy. Uh, it's not super high on my favorite movies list, but it's definitely up there. It's just a really good time. It has, uh, what's the name of the guy? The guy from uh, Social Network, and he is uh, Lex Luthor in that movie, Superman. Um, uh, I wish I could pull up his name without looking this up. The answer is Jesse Eisenberg, is the answer. Um, it's got him in it, and uh, it's also got, if you're a fan of um, Woody Harrelson, it's got him in it. It's got Emma Stone in it. It's, I mean, it's a great cast. It's even got, uh, what's her name? Is it Abigail uh, from um, Little Miss Sunshine is the fourth member of the group. Uh, Abigail... Brisbane is her name, I think. Breslin. Yeah, that's her. That's definitely her. I called it. Um, yeah, and uh, so it's a great cast. It's really funny. It's got a good gimmick to it, where there's uh, the main character uh, is kind of OCD. Uh, and has all these rules that he follows, and that's how he survives the zombie apocalypse. And then it kind of takes fun, silly uh, directions from there. Um, and it's just a good time. And if you enjoy that, maybe you've already seen it, and you're looking for something similar to that. There was a show a while back called Z Nation that kind of fit that similar sort of theme. It might be worth checking out if you haven't checked that out. It's Z Nation. Uh, it lasted about like four or five years and then it ended and uh, it was really fun the whole time. I don't think it ever really got worse at any point. I don't know if it necessarily got a lot better <laughs> at any point either. I think it got better and then plateaued -ish. Maybe got like a little bit worse, but never as bad as it was in the beginning. And the beginning was never that bad. And it was always, you know, it's kind of, it, it kept us steady. It, it kept mostly, st it was mostly consistent. Uh, and consistently funny and uh, worth checking out. If you're, if you, The Walking Dead was too serious and so for you, but you were into that sort of zombie idea, and sometimes you enjoyed The Walking Dead and you want something that's more just faster paced and fun, then yeah, Z Nation might be right up your alley. Z Nation. Moving on from there. Uh, people looking for more straight zombie fare, you could always watch George Romero's old classics that uh, includes Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, Land of the Dead. Uh, or there's Zack Snyder's remake of The Dawn of the Dead, which was his first major motion picture, apparently. There's also 28 Days Later and 28 Weeks Later, which are both successful zombie movies. From there, the list could go on forever. More movies than I could care to count, but honestly, I think I've listed the top ones that if you haven't watched things on the... Uh, like, if there are things on that list you haven't checked out, and you're pseudo-somewhat interested in touching on the zombie genre, those are the, those are the big ones, I think, that I've... I've listed. Um, no matter what you're into, the chances are there's a zombie movie out there you'd enjoy. I haven't even talked about video games, Resident Evil series are just one series out of hundreds, and it's far from the best representation of zombies. Resident Evil, the games and the movies, are more akin to weird Japanese manga action porn meets zombies. The early games play like slower adventure games, but the later games are more action focused, and the story in the whole series is just a manga style bonkers. Um, so if you've never actually given Resident Evil a, a, a chance, but you just had this idea in your head that it was something like The Walking Dead, it's it's actually not at all. 
um, is tangentially zombie um, connected. But there are other games to check out. Dead Rising is popular, but the older games were somewhat clunky and hard to control and also have a certain level of Japanese manga insanity. Um, I've heard great things about Dying Light, which I would point to as the best game for zombie survival. It's like, Dying Light has been so close to the top. There's been games that have been like at the top of my, I gotta play these games. And they just keep getting bumped lower and lower for other games. Um, Life is Strange is another one. Life is Strange and Dying Light are two that are like right there. And it's like, I want to play these games so bad, but I keep putting them aside for something else. Um, so definitely check out Dying Light if you haven't, if you're a better person than me. And you're interested in like zombie survival. Um, I think there's a lot of focus on like uh, parkour. So it's a little bit like um, what I'm going to mention next. Dead Island meets Mirror's Edge. Uh, so next is Dead Island, which allows for co-op, as does Dead Rising that I mentioned above. If you're into playing zombie survival with others, the classic Left 4 Dead 1 and 2 are amazing, and I believe you can play the first game's campaign in the second game. But it's older now and clunky in some ways. Uh, for instance, there's no looking down the sights with your gun. You just kinda, you're just kind of walking around with your gun always at your hip, and you're just like firing it wildly. And, yeah, which is a weird thing to get used to now that once you play later games. They, uh, the creators of Left 4 Dead are creating a new sequel, a spiritual sequel, called Back for Blood. And that could be a game that's worth uh, keeping an eye on if they manage to modernize the formula. Because the Left 4 Dead series was absolutely fantastic. I, re I remember playing the shit out of those games on Xbox 360 with my uh, buddy when I was in university. And he was uh, in university as well, I guess. Um... Of course, if you are interested in something like that, you can always check out the zombie modes in all the Call of Duty games. Uh, my personal favorites are in Black Ops 1 and 2. They have the best zombie maps, in my opinion, but those are older. And they're, uh, they keep the zombie mode keeps coming back with every new game they put out, every other new game they put out. I, I believe this, the way it works, if you're not deep into the Call of Duty ecosystem, is that there are multiple studios that make Call of Duty. And so they take turns each uh, year or other year or two, uh, sometimes there's three studios and it might be every three years. Um, and then so one of those studios loves the zombies and they, they made the zombies and their, their, their version of Call of Duty always has the zombies. And then the other version, the other studio who actually started Call of Duty, um, and now uh, at least this is how it used to work, uh, they had nothing to do with the zombies and they didn't give a shit about the zombies. Um, and then I don't even think that studio is even involved anymore. Now I think it's um, the studio that does the zombies and the Black Ops stuff. And then there's um, another studio now that does them, the other ones, the Modern Warfare line. And then there's another studio now that does it. I don't know. I'm throwing my hands in the air. <laughs> but uh, yeah, lots of zombie stuff in that if, you, if you're into that kind of stuff. I could go on forever listing zombie video games and movies and shows that are good. It's not just a genre with a lot of entries, it's a genre with a lot of entries that are very, very good. The Last of Us is considered one of the greatest games of all, uh, of all time ever made, and is technically a zombie game. The Walking Dead was at one point the highest rated show on TV. I Am Legend is kind of a zombie movie. Shaun of the Dead is one of the most famous comedies. It's gotten to the point now in our society that if you're one of those people who just hates zombies and refuses to watch or play anything with zombies, you are missing out on some of society's most defining pop culture staples. Sorry, you're just going to have to turn your nose up at the gore, hold your breath, and dive in. Zombies. Moving on from there to the Geeky Weekly TV rankings. Zombies. Um, at number 15, there's Black Lightning. Uh, that's just... Let's just stop for a second. 15 things. Something needs to drop from this list. And I feel like it's got to be Black Lightning based on this week's um, episode. I waited a while to watch this for a good reason, uh, it turns out, because it was god-awful. And to be honest, I wish I hadn't watched it at all. I wish I just dropped it from the list, especially when there's 15 shows to watch this week. Um, Anissa and Grace, newly married, decided to take their honeymoon in the video game world of Cyberpunk 2077, apparently. Which was really, I, I really enjoyed the driving scenes where 
the this episode did like five or six driving scenes. It was just them driving through this one street, this one CG street of the same cyberpunky buildings and stuff. Just like, yeah, we're driving through Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven, but it's a real place. Totally, just don't ask questions. And then the next thing, you're in a building and they're walking in the building and you can't see anything that was outside the building. And it's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, awful. Just this episode was so bad. Um, they they get to Cyberpunk 2077 and they're in, to their shock and horror that uh, apparently uh, all the NPCs are stuck in weird exposition feedback loops and all they can do is continue to talk in truth to everyone else in the room who already knows everything that they're saying. So like, for instance, the Khalil character walks up to his best friend and says, hey, remember how we're best friends? Remember how we helped each other last week and did some stuff? Yeah, that stuff totally happened. And uh, now you've got this lab down here that we're standing in. And, and I totally built that bar upstairs. And it's like, yeah, you did do that stuff. Yeah, I did. Awesome. That's a good conversation we just had. It's like, what the fuck? Is, what am I watching? It was just the worst written piece of junk I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and I, I hated every second of it. There was practically nothing redeemable. I was going to give it like credit for having good action. But I don't even think it really pulled off that off very well. I, I felt awkward about the fact that half of the henchmen he was brutally murdering were, were women. And it's like, it's progressive, but it's not because he's just murdering these women. And all I can think about is how they had lives, probably. Um, and you don't know what they were doing at home. And you see when it's a guy that's just being horribly murdered. And it's, you know, like when a super, uh, when a Punisher style superhero is murdering a bunch of evil hench uh, male henchmen you assume that they're probably shitty people who go around um catcalling and um drugging women or you know doing shitty things um but then when it's a woman when half of them are women henchmen then it's like it's, it's harder to assume that they're doing they're doing shitty things in their off time um so, I mean, and it's not so bad, like, it's fine when it's women henchmen and the superhero is beating the crap out of these henchmen and knocking them out and then fighting the big boss or whatever. But when, but in this, the dude was literally just murdering these people, just straight up murdering these people as if they were doing anything worse than defending this building that he was attacking. It was, made me very uncomfortable. This whole episode was just awful and I hated it. Um, I, I don't want to watch this anymore. <laughs> is where I've gotten to with the show and I know it's it's ending this season and I really should just stick with the last few episodes but it's just it's so bad Black Lightning with one star <laughs> this week number 15 on a way uh uh a really uh, uh whatchamacallit week a full a full week of television this week Moving on to number 14 on the list, The Goldbergs with two stars. This wasn't the worst episode of the show ever, but there were multiple cringeworthy moments that just weren't fun to watch, including Adam making a complete fool of himself on stage. What an absurd thing for someone to do. It's unbelievable that uh, his girlfriend Bria stayed with him after that. It would be like Taylor Swift going up to Kanye after he interrupted her awards and being like, I still love you though, you're just wacky sometimes. And then they went home and got married. Uh, nope, Adam is the worst, and wow. Also, Jeff's breakup from Erica isn't getting any easier to swallow, and that was a hard subplot, and it's just, it was not a great episode of Goldbergs. Um, but it wasn't as bad as Black Lightning, I'll tell you that much. Moving on from there to number 13, uh, Home Economics, two stars. I believe a, uh, it actually aired the previous week. Um, but I didn't watch it, and I had no intentions of watching it. Then I happened to catch the pilot um, on a rewatch, uh, rerun while I was just about to go to bed. Um, and I gotta admit, I was fully expecting it to be awful, which is why I didn't give it a chance. Uh, and I had seen too many similar-looking um, new age sitcoms trying to be the the next new thing um, with a super loud laugh track and. Uh, and a lot of winking at the camera, like, we're making jokes. Um, but this was Sans Laugh Track, uh, and not too much winking at the camera. And some of the characters seemed almost likable, which is in some ways more important quality, uh, more important than the quality of the humor, which wasn't great. But a couple of the lines made me laugh. 
It's not good, but I might give it another chance. And this week it was better than the Goldbergs. Um, I watched the second episode and it was all right as well. Um, it again, I feel like I'll keep watching, but I didn't think it was great. Uh, I think it even dropped the. I, I was gonna give the show three and a half, uh, two and a half stars, and then I dropped it to just two stars because the second episode was like mm, fine, but I wouldn't go beyond fine. Um, but I mean, if you're starved up for new sitcoms and shit, like <laughs> that might be something to check out because there aren't a lot of like good sitcoms that are airing new right now. So when there isn't a lot out there, you can kind of latch on to something that's fine and accept it for what it is. Um, so home economics thir uh, is on thirteenth on the list with two stars. Moving on from there, number twelve on the list, Kung Fu with three and a half stars. Every time I say Kung Fu, I feel that sounds racist. <laughs> Even though now it's a show that's like all Asians, but it still sounds racist when I say Kung Fu. <laughs> Is that a problem with me? This wasn't a bad second episode. In fact, I enjoyed it. That said, I feel most of the strength of the show lies in how good the lead actress is. If she wasn't so charming and engaging, I'd have likely checked out by now. There were multiple parts in this show where I found myself laughing at its expense, but I think the lead actress is great, and I like her dad, and how much he seems to just love the shit out of her. And I sort of liked the weird storyline they were hinting at involving magical weapons. I don't think the original, ever, the original show ever really got that magical, so I'm excited for more fantasy in this version. That's what I want to see. I think that would keep me uh, watching as if the show got more fantastical. Moving on from there, number 11 on the list, Batwoman with three and a half stars. I actually think this was a pretty good episode of the show. That is to say, it was engaging throughout and had some all right dynamics. Plot gear continued to turn and Alice wasn't nearly as much of a snore as she was last week. Or last time the show aired, I don't think it aired last week. That said, uh, Daddy Crows, uh, as in uh, the original Kate's father, he's a crow. I can't remember his name, but a uh, crow is the people who are like police, but they're not. Uh, and if you're not watching the show, you don't want to talk about it anyway. But his stupid addiction arc was a little unsubtle, shall we say. Um, also, none of the arcs necessarily stood out. And the opening fight scene was poorly choreographed, to say the least. The later fight scene was choreographed better until Lucas came out of nowhere at the end of Save the Day. Was that construction site literally right beside the Batcave? Because he was in the Batcave, and he's like, oh no, she needs help. And then, like, a minute later, he's standing out there with, like, two guns, being like, yeah. It's like, how did you... Huh? Did he beam over there from the Enterprise? Like, what the fuck? Uh, they, did, they did introduce some villainous characters, like the woman with the cane, who seemed like they would make... In, uh, the woman with the cane seemed like they would make an enjoyable villain, and the there was someone else who seemed cool, too. Whatever. He was some old dude uh, with a cool accent, I think. Uh, I never doubted for a second that the woman with the cane was evil, though. Uh, it was kind of obvious. Um, and exciting, kind of. I, I, when We need more notable villains on this show, especially because the most notable villain on the show, we want to be good because she's so enjoyable. Um, so we need more villains that we can root for and be evil as fuck. Uh, moving on from there to number 10 on the list, Supergirl with four stars. Which just goes to show how strong some of the shows are. We're at the four stars already and we're still at number 10. Um, there were weak and strong aspects of this episode. I loved everything with Lex and Lena. And I didn't hate Kara's scenes in the Phantom Zone. Though her prolonged leg injury was meme worthy. Pretty much the entire episode was Supergirl going. You know, like uh, Peter Griffin in Family Guy when he hurts his, his shin. Um, and that was her for the entire episode. Uh, that said, I wasn't bored by everything going on with the rest of the gang and their struggles coping with the loss of dealing with the fandoms. But I was constantly rolling my eyes at the ridiculous overdramatics. I especially loved, loved the way Martian Manhunter called Alex out for being a weepy emotional woman. And then he and Brainy both have these huge emotional outbursts later in the episode and fall apart completely. Uh, Brainy, I think, even tantrums and like throws things, breaks things and shit, and then just cries. Um, some of that was intentional. Like I think they intended that to be ironic. Um, but I don't think my laughter completely was intentional. Uh, at every point in this episode, I feel like there was a lot of things I laughed at that were not intended to be funny. 
Um, so, yeah, Supergirl. Moving on from there to Family Guy, number nine on the list with four and a half stars. This was a strong and funny episode of the show. Though with some plotting flaws, I wouldn't say it was the story that held up the episode, though the concept was strong. Brian finds out he was stolen from another family and finds out that family is more pretentious than he is. As a Brian fan, uh, as a Brian fan, I found aspects of this episode fun, but I feel like it wasn't as fun as it could have been. Like I should have enjoyed it more than I did. Um, I didn't love Brian's arc overall, and I felt it, uh, it was a little underwhelming. Peter's hair growing long was interesting and led to some funny asides. Honestly, the random asides were some of the best parts of the episode, keeping the weak execution of a great premise and conceit from bringing the episode down too much. A low four stars, but not as low as Supergirl. Supergirl barely got four stars this week. Only because it was fun. <laughs> you know, like, I, if I didn't enjoy myself watching it that as much as I did, I don't think I would have given it four stars. I didn't really enjoy it. I didn't deserve it. Uh, moving on from there, number eight on the list of the nevers. I enjoyed the first episode of this show. It was a show I could see myself wa uh, wanting to watch more of. It has a lot of very cool dynamics. It's a neat setting. It's got some well-recognizable tropes that I enjoy. And I like the main character, both lead women, in fact, and much of the surrounding cast. But it is very Joss Whedon, unmistakably Joss Whedon, the most Joss Whedon thing we have ever seen since Dollhouse. And it comes armed with every Joss Whedon stereotype. And he's listed as wearing all the hats, writer, director, and executive producer. So HBO insisting he doesn't have much to do with it is a lie. He's all over this in every way. And on top of that, besides the main character, I didn't feel myself getting that attached to anyone else. Nor did I find myself caring too much as to the goings-on of the universe. I look forward to the Victorian shenanigans and the main chick kicking a bunch of ass. But that's about all that interests me. Everything else is just inoffensive, funny things that are happening to fill the hour. Also, the like 10 minutes of people getting touched at the end went on far too long. It literally was like the, the episode was over and they were like, but then the main character thinks back to the night when they all got their powers and the thing that you see in the trailer that you assume is going to be at the beginning of the episode is actually at the end of the episode and it goes on for like 10 straight minutes of people just being like, Wow, and super slow Zack Snyder slow motion, like Zack Snyder cut slow motion, and they're all just like, so, which is kind of funny when you think about it, because it was Joss Whedon who directed this, and he ruined Zack Snyder's Justice League, but then he made his never sing kind of like Zack Snyder's Justice League by making it just a 10 minute long slow motion war fest where no new information was learned. <laughs> it was so bad. Uh, that was the worst part of the episode. Other than that, 10 minutes, I enjoyed myself for the most part. I'm actually surprised I didn't take a, like, a star off for that horrible ending. But it looked pretty. You know what? There was one piece of information that was interesting. It seemed to be, from that scene, to be an alien spaceship that gave them the powers and that was kind of cool and we didn't know that i don't think the people know that people kept saying like it must have been sent by one of the uh other nations that are trying to de destroy us or whatever but like that that thing looked pretty damn alien to me um so yeah kind of cool maybe there's gonna be a alien twist somewhere in here maybe they're gonna get invaded by aliens and the guy people with, with superpowers are gonna have to fight the aliens and joss Whedon sitting on that secret like yeah I did that. I, I came up with some cool idea where a bunch of women are going to beat up some aliens. And it's like, cool, awesome. Go back to your hole, Joss Whedon. Uh, moving on from there. Number seven on the list, The Flash. Four and a half stars. <clears throat> it was an entertaining episode of The Flash this week, which is a bit of a surprise. I remember seeing the promo for this week's episode and rolling my eyes. But I ended up enjoying it a lot more than I thought I would. <clears throat> it just had a fun vibe to it. I also enjoyed the focus on Frost, and I even enjoyed the bartender, who she started flirting with and then fought at the end of the episode. I don't enjoy that she ended up surrendering to the police, especially because this storyline has seemed manufactured from the start. Perhaps it's a way to write Killer Frost off the show till her pregnancy is done, at which point they at least gave her a really strong episode to go off on. I also appreciate that Barry's drama with Nora got resolved this week. All in all, this episode just didn't let the usual bullshit drag it down and was a stronger episode for it. Moving on from there, number six on the list, Saturday Night Live, with four and a half stars, and this was a great episode this week. An amazing episode, I say, in fact. 
Considering how bad the show has been lately and how uninterested I was in the host, I'm shocked at the quality of this episode. It was actually consistent. The opening sketch wasn't great, but far from the worst of the season. The opening monologue, same thing, but every sketch from there was pure quality and bursting with laughs. I'm actually a little shocked. We're supposed to believe the same writers did this episode that did every other episode this season. I almost don't want to believe it's possible. The weekend update was good as well, though a couple of the characters were snoozes I skipped on. And I wasn't a fan of the musical guest, but considering how bad the show has been lately, this was almost like watching a totally different show. So if you can have a chance to go back and catch that episode if you haven't been watching it because you thought the show sucked, that might be the episode to catch because it was actually like every sketch was just a banger. It was great. So that was Saturday Night Live. Moving on from there, number five on the list, Shameless was four and a half stars. This is the finale of Shameless, the final end. And did uh, Emma Rossum come back? No, she did not. Apparently it just had to do with timing. They tried really hard and she wanted to make it, but the timing was just off and they couldn't make it work. Um, so that sucks. I actually felt it was a very good series finale. I don't think it was flawless. And I think I'm even being nice to give it four and a half stars. I feel like Debbie's new girlfriend was a strange addition in the final couple episodes. Things didn't feel all that final with everyone, which is fine. Frank's death was dealt with beautifully. Him slowly dying in the hospital with memories of his family all the way back in season one. Those scenes really made me feel stuff. Choked me up. And I thought him flying off at the end giving a big speech worked really well for the final moment. It felt a lot like the show had come full circle. The song was from the pilot, I believe, the one that they were singing. And the pilot also ends with them celebrating around a fire. We've been able to enjoy the ride alongside the Gallaghers for an easy decade now. And it's time to let go with the understanding that even though we are all going our separate ways, we'll continue surviving and fighting and holding on. Finales are a hard thing to get right, and this one felt like a stronger one, no matter the flaws. So if you haven't given Shameless a chance, um, mainly, uh, but you're interested in it, you might be interested to know that uh, it ends pretty strongly, and therefore it's good the whole way, you know, like it's, it's strong the whole way through. Um, that's, it's a show that lasted 10 seasons and never really got awful, so uh, it's worth checking out. If you weren't checking it out because you were afraid it might get worse, it, it, well, it didn't. So yeah, I mean, it kind of did a little, but it never got bad. Moving on from there to Fear the Walking Dead at the number four spot with five stars. So the top four shows this week all had five stars. This episode of Fear the Walking Dead was amazing. It dragged a little at first, which, how did it get five stars? Uh, with John slowly giving into his suicidal urges. But I felt the pacing improved as he came across Morgan and Dakota, and the three of them riding together made for a very engaging episode. The whole time I was watching the episode, I was thinking about how much I enjoyed all three characters, especially Dakota. How I really looked forward to the rest of the season with these characters. So for the episode to end the way it did, it was one gut punch after another. I never saw the ending coming. I didn't see, um, I guess, spoilers. You have three. Uh, skip ahead a minute. Okay, three, two, one, here we go. I didn't see Dakota turning that dark. I didn't see what happened to John. I'm not even not spoiling it that much. I really thought he was going to make it somehow. I am shook. That ending left me shook and pushed the rating a whole star. So it was really probably a four star episode, but the strength of the twist at the end uh, was so impactful that it gave it an, an extra star, is what I'm saying. And yet it was a very impactful uh, twist at the end. I, I didn't see it coming. And they even like, even after it happens, there's still like 10 minutes where it's like, it could go the other, no, 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 it's not going to be, okay, that, that, that happened, okay. It, it's rough, it's rough and it's hard and it hurts. Um, but it was great, and uh, it's it's possible it shot itself in the foot, and then the show's going to be awful now, from now on, um, but this episode was great. Um, so there's that. Moving on from there to the top three. Bum, 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 top three shows of the week. Um, and you know what? All three of these shows are pretty um, unmissable. Starting with Pennyworth uh, at number three. This was a great finale of the show. It was already expecting, I, I was already expecting some curveballs in this episode. We already all the curveballs I was expecting. The balls curved as expected, but they curved a different direction than I was expecting. I knew Martha wasn't pregnant with Bruce. I thought she was going to die, but instead she lived and gave birth to a girl. 
I knew Alfie's father was lying and that the poison was in London, but I thought it would be in his wheelchair and instead it was in Harwood's coffin. I thought everything with Alfie's old military commander was fun, especially the way he stops poison from uh, destroying London. Uh, and then he somehow survived and became a super soldier. Like, absolutely insane. Uh, the number of ridiculous over-the-top curveballs in that episode, the number of ridiculous things going on. I don't even know what this show's trying to do anymore um, or what it's trying to be, but it is amazing and uh, never ceases to amaze and shock and just be fun uh, and silly and over-the-top and not give a shit about anything like canon or anything <laughs> uh, or history. Uh, it's just giving up on all of that. And, uh, yeah. So if you haven't checked out Pennyworth, it's had two seasons now. Uh, and they're, they were, they've both been fantastic. They're very British, so if you're a fan of, like, if you're an Anglophile, um, as I think a character uses the word in Lock and Key, um, if you're an Anglophile, then definitely check out Pennyworth, because there's just a lot of great British accents and people saying very British things, uh, British idioms. Um, that never get old, um, and being incredibly British, <laughs> so, so, so like, you know, like, oh, you've, you've come with your gun to shoot me, well, let's just quickly drink this cup of tea first. <laughs> it's great, I love it, I love Pennyworth, it's absolutely worth watching, and it's had two great seasons now, and who knows how great the next season's gonna be, but I definitely know that it's been renewed, and I cannot wait for that next season to come. Moving on from there to, uh, the number two spot, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, that's right. I think you know what number one is going to be. But Falcon and the Winter Soldier got the number two spot with five stars. It was another good episode, though it did drag on, on a schmidge. I'd almost call it the weakest of the season, but I think the scene at the end did a lot to improve this episode. Kind of like um, I said with Fear the Walking Dead, how it was a weaker than five star episode until the twist, uh, which elevates it back to that five stars just by how impactful the twist is. I think the same goes for Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I feel like it was a, a weaker uh, episode this week than usual. And then the end was just turned that around, just turned it on its head. Where it's like, oh, did we lull you into a bit of uh, uh, into a kind of a relaxed state of mind? Well, pcha! and suddenly it's like, what just happened? And holy shit. Wow. Um, so, yeah, definitely, again, the twist uh, pushed this episode to be amazing. At least as good as the other ones. Um, I like how dark it got, and I like that the credits were changed to be darker as well. I liked that Sam almost got to the one woman. Uh, I can't remember her name. It's kind of weird. Uh, but now she's gone too far, and now John Walker went too far in return and murdered the doctor, and everything is insane. Overall, it was another great episode, but thank God for that ending, or this episode wouldn't have anything necessary to make it stand out on its own. Which would have been fine. Not every episode of the show has to be amazing for the show to be amazing, but so far, every episode of the show has. And that's Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Moving on from there to Invincible, which earns all five of its stars without some weird twist at the end. But um, was there a weird twist at the end? No, there wasn't really that weird of a twist. It was more um, game changer than a twist. Like a, a story twist uh, is... The game changer is more like uh, it's not necessarily a new information so much as it's um, reveals within the characters themselves that like change the dynamic. So has it sunk in yet? This show is amazing. Invincible. Five stars. It's so good. Number one on the list. How many times do I have to feature it at the top of this ranking for you to give it a chance? I'm assuming most of you haven't just because... I'm assuming this is a show that's hard to sell, which is seeming to not be the case because Twitter just seems to be full of people of all types and creeds loving the show. Um, and, uh, and social media is just full of people loving the show and it seems to be getting all kinds of success and uh, has already been renewed for new stuff and uh, there's a movie coming and... Uh, apparently the movie's not going to step on the show's um, toes, like apparently it's going to do its own thing, so the show's still like a canonical version of this t this story. Um, it almost sounds like they're not really going into the the movie, but either it's going to be like an alternate take, or possibly it's even going to tell like a side story that like, you know, outside of the main story that maybe even keeps it in canon. I don't know. I don't know what they're doing exactly, but it sounds like it's going to be very different. Um, so the show, worth watching on its own. This episode was another fantastic episode with so many great moments that I recognized as being comic accurate, such as when his friend learns who he is, but it was also enjoyable on his own merits, and I feel like it added 
it, it took things and like it took comic accurate moments and then built around it more depth and layers that just made it even more badass and awesome um such as when his friend learns who he is uh i think i already read that and if you and if you had read the comic as i said there are so many added aspects to make this better i love how relatable the characters are I loved Zachary Quinto's character caring for Monster Girl. I loved Adam Eve running away from home to just fly around and help people with natural disasters and food shortages and things. I loved Mark going on a tour of the university. I loved the plot with the dude murdering people to make robot drones. This whole episode was just fantastic in a season where every episode is this good. I say again, why are you not watching this yet? It's Amazon Prime. You get free shipping too. You're welcome. Uh, that's Invincible. Number one on the list. Invincible. You'll watch it. I believe in you. You're not going to make the same mistakes um, other people have. You're going to make the right choices. You're going to listen to me when I suggest that you watch something. And uh, that's how this relationship is going to work. And uh, if you don't like it, uh, too bad. Also, if you could call me daddy. <laughs> Let's make this really awkward and weird. All right, moving on from there. Geekly Predictions. Uh, that is, new releases people will be talking about around the water cooler over the next week, starting at the top with Stowaway coming to Netflix on Thursday. I had never heard of this before. I had zero interest in checking this out until I watched the trailer, and I was like, you know what, it doesn't seem that terrible. I got a laugh at first at the concept. Um, the idea is basically that some dude stows away on the ship, and the way it looks in the trailer at first, it looks like he just fell asleep on it, and then he wakes up, and he's like, oh my god, we're in space. Oh my god, we're in space. What the hell? How did I fall asleep and wake up in space? It's like, how the hell does this happen? But then uh, it looks like in the flashbacks that maybe he was locked unconscious or something and hidden somewhere, or I don't know what, what happens. But uh, it looks interesting. Uh, there's some good actors in it uh, that I think is a lot of the, uh, like Tony Collette and Daniel Day Kim and Anna P Kendrick are like, it's like a story of four people, and those are three of the four people. It's like, give me this. Give it to me. I give you my money. This is how this works, right? I don't actually have money. I'm sorry. I'm broke. So, uh, sorry. Still away. Um, but it looks fantastic. And that's coming out on Netflix on Thursday. I think that's just a movie. Um, I could be wrong, but who knows? Um, but that seems like it's worth checking out. That's still away on Thursday on Netflix. Moving on to the second prediction for this coming week. Mayor of East Town on HBO Sunday. Um, that is, uh, I keep seeing advertisements for this, um, but I stop, I'm telling it to stop, but it's not stopping, no, okay. Um, it, uh, I keep seeing advertisements for this, it looks like a sort of noir detective story thing, uh, her, she's Kate Winslet, um, I didn't know that it also has, uh, the, um, Evan Peters in it, which is exciting, and that makes me want to see it more. Um, I've never really cared all that much for uh, Kate Winslet outside of um, things. Um, but, I mean, sure, I'll, I'll watch something with Evan Peters in it. Um, and I like the noir genre, even though I don't know why, but the trailer just doesn't really do much for me. Um, but it certainly seems to be the thing of most quality of coming out uh, in the coming week. So uh, you might want to check that out if you have the time. I don't know if I will make it through more than five or ten minutes of that show um, with all the other shows going on right now. Maybe if I drop Black Lightning, then I'll have time for that. Um, I also don't know about Stowaway, but we'll see. Um, but you should watch it if you think it looks interesting. I think it looks interesting. Um, I like the space stuff. I mean, it all looks like fun. Moving on from there to uh, number three on the list, MLB The Show 21 on... Uh, is coming to consoles and Game Pass as a video game, and it's coming out today. Uh, that's right, I said it's coming to Game Pass on Xbox. So uh, you can, if you have the Game Pass, you can just download it and play it. Um, the reason why uh, this uh, game has been getting a lot of uh, talk lately is it is a game that has been known for being a qual a a. It's been known for being a quality uh, sport uh, game. I mean. Uh, the sport genre has a lot of quality simulations. Like there's, uh, Madden NFL is 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 lauded, and and uh, NHL is lauded, um, and NBA Two K is lauded. Um, the non Two K ones not so much. But I mean, the point is, e each sport has its franchise that's awesome. 
um, and does its sport justice. Uh, FIFA does its sport justice. Um, and MLB, MLB has never really had a mainline game that does its sport justice every year. Um, it, it Besides MLB The Show, um, which is, I guess, the most currently... Because um, uh, any of the other uh, baseball games I've tried to compete against it have dropped off here and there. But the really shitty thing is that MLB The Show has for the longest time been a PlayStation exclusive uh, game. And now since it's the only baseball game left on the field, and it's been known as being awesome um, and is usually well rated and uh, plays fun, I guess. I've never, I'm not a huge baseball fan. But um, this year, apparently the major league baseball league um stepped in and uh gave playstation uh or i at least they made the choice to make it multi-platform even though it's known for being a playstation exclusive um and then not just that then they apparently made the choice again to have it on game pass and uh what people are saying is that uh the the league of uh, mlb they're they're noticing how uh, the world seems to be, I guess, I'm assuming, uh, somewhat against baseball. Like, uh, I don't, I think their viewership's at an all time low. People just don't, I know personally, I don't care anything about baseball. I think it's one of the, I would rank it as one of the most boringest of the sports. Um, and I think so. What they're trying to do, I believe, is, is they think this is the chance to push it to, to younger, uh, people and people who maybe don't care about play baseball, uh, as a way to try and get them interested. Um, and I think it could work because, like, for instance, a lot of uh, sports I wouldn't give a shit about or n I would know nothing about if not for the video games. It's like, okay, now I understand the rules of football because I can see how how they work in this game setting. Um, so I, I think in that sense, it could, uh, and, and being fr on free to, to Game Pass people, of which there are so many, it could be a chance, and especially so many kids who, pr uh, like their parents, uh, will see that as a, a, a about a a valid alternative to constantly buying their kids games they can just buy the game pass and then the kid can play whatever's on the game pass and so the, there could be a lot of new uh fans suddenly that get added to baseball i think that's what um the mlb is is trying to do with this uh because if, from all the sounds it sounds like uh they really pushed this playstation exclusive to no longer be exclusive and uh so a lot of people are a lot of people who are um big into the console wars uh see this as, as, a, as a huge moment of peace but from all extensive purposes um it said that this was very much pushed uh forward by the mlb who are just trying to seek out new fans to their sport uh so that's mlb the show 21 coming out on all consoles and on game pass today i don't think it's coming out on switch but who knows uh, moving on from there to number four on the list big shot disney plus comes out today I, I'm not that interested in it. It seemed not bad, um, but it also just seems like it's the Mighty Ducks, um, but with basketball instead of hockey. And I mean, all these sports titles are all the same anyway, which could be said for the video games too, but uh, this is a, a show we're talking about here. Um, yes, original series. And it's just like, I guess the Mighty Ducks one did well, so they thought they would do it for basketball too. But they, if that's true, they came out with a real fast. Like, fuck. <laughs> Maybe somebody just really likes sports uh, stories. Um, moving on from there, Monday comes out in theaters in VOD. Um, I don't know what that means, what VOD is coming out for. I don't think it's coming out anywhere in Canada. Um, but if you can find it somewhere in a theater or something, and you really want a romance with Sebastian Stan, and uh, and he, he seems... It, I watched the trailer and it seemed better than I was expecting. Um, there looks like there's a lot of heat between them. They really uh, um, sell the chemistry um, and uh, passion. Um, so if you're looking for something hot and steamy, that might be something to check out. That's Monday. Come into theaters and VOD if you can find it. Good luck. Uh, honorable mentions, things that didn't make that list but are worth mentioning uh, for various reasons. New episodes of Invincible and Falcon and the Winter Soldier will air again uh, next Thursday night and Friday morning, respectively. And therefore, you should be catching them both because they're both appointment viewing. Uh, no one wasting time with this blog should be behind on either of those shows because they are that good. 
seriously just take my word for it why are you listening to this and not taking my word for things who are you um theoretical person who isn't watching those sex shows uh, and probably doesn't exist considering how many subscribers are on disney plus and how many of those subscribers are watching Fox. Um, Mythic Quest and Van Helsing Returns uh, as well. That's another honorable mention. I don't watch either of those shows. Um, I've heard good things about Mythic Quest on Apple Plus. Um, and I think I tried watching the pilot of Van Helsing and didn't like it. But I, I hear other people like it, so maybe it got better from there. Um, if you have considered getting a new streaming service, Apple Plus. Like, I subscribe to Netflix. I subscribe to um, Disney Plus. Um, and then I have a subscription to Crave only because of my um, TV subscription. Um, and I hate it. I hate Crave, kind of. I don't hate Crave. I don't, like, go to bed, uh, like, fucking Crave. Urgh. But, like, I just, I, I don't, I, I wish I wasn't supporting Crave. And I, I considered not for supporting Crave, but I just keep doing it anyway. Um, just because it's run by Bell and Bell sucks and they're running it horribly and it's nowhere close to what HBO Max could be if we had just had HBO Max um but so if you if you were looking for a new streaming service and your choices were between paramount plus and uh apple plus um and i would put those somewhere near the bottom of the uh top tier um the one difference between them is paramount plus has a big library of back catalog whereas apple plus everything on it basically is just stuff they've made which is interesting like i i i actually almost applaud that at this point because of the fact that i keep hearing about these shows that actually aren't that bad such as mythic quest and for all mankind um on and on um and it's like well good for them like they're creating their own ecosystem of things and uh that's impressive especially because i think they're both about the same price and one uh in paramount plus in canada especially doesn't even have its original shows like star trek or anything like that it's just it's just old shows like Bewitched and uh, NCIS and CSI and, uh, you know, like just old shows like that. Uh, and that's it. That's the only thing on the pro on the service. There's no Star Trek. There's no uh, The Stand even, which is on Amazon Prime instead. Uh, like they sold all their Canadian distribution rights and so they have absolutely nothing to show on their service. And yet they're still charging the same prices as, as the American version. Uh, and change the name and all that it's so ridiculous so paramount plus is nothing in canada and then apple plus just has their own library of, library of things um uh, which is worth more to you like do you like a lot of old shows because there's a lot of old stuff on paramount plus's library it's insane actually this they've managed to collect like a hundred things that are all like wow i remember watching that when i was like 20 years ago um but yeah, I don't know why I'm still talking about this. Uh, but yeah. Apple Plus, it, that, I guess that's all I'm trying to say is Apple Plus. Is, is pretty awesome that it's managed to build something just out of its own stuff. and Build a library just out of its own works. Good, good job, Apple Plus, I guess. Moving on from there, Geekly News Headlines. It's news from the past week you need to know, so you won't be as ignorant as a QAnon loser. Starting at the top, archaeologists unearth a 3,000-year-old lost golden city. Uh, the article claims, uh, I've decided to change the way this uh, segment works, mostly just for the writing of it. Um, so now people can get some of my opinions on these articles as well. Um, so they don't have to listen to the podcast to get my opinions on these articles. So I have little write-ups uh, underneath the links. Um, so at the top one, archaeologists unearthed 3,000 year old lost golden city, to which I say that the article claims it is one of the most important archaeological finds since Tutankhamun's tomb, which for non-archaeologist enthusiasts like me is like the old we need to know. Cool, keep at it. <laughs> you know? So pretty much what I'm saying is that uh, it, the article wasn't that interesting, um, but it's, it certainly makes it sound like it's an important uh, find and that's cool. Uh, it was a story by Becky Fiera, um, September 4th, 2021. Nope, that was April 9th, 2021. They just don't know how to write out the dates. Um, but yeah, this I thought it was a somewhat interesting article. If you want to read it, you can check it out. That's uh, at 99geek.ca. Um, but moving on. Cops caught on video holding a black army lieutenant at gunpoint and pepper spraying him. Let's read that article because that one's fun. Not fun. Uh, this is a story by Emma Ackerman on April 9th, 2021. 
I'm done wrong on Vice.com. Karen Nazario, that's his name, was driving, and I'm sure you've all probably heard this story by now. Uh, he was driving his newly purchased Chevy Tahoe home when two police officers pulled him over in Windsor, Virginia, whipped out their guns and started barking orders. With their weapons raised, the officers demanded that Nazario, a black and Latino man, get out of the SUV. Nazario looked in the mirror and saw he was being held at gunpoint and placed his cell phone on his dashboard to film the December 5th encounter. He repeatedly asked to know what was going on. At one point, he even admitted to being afraid to leave the vehicle. Yeah, you should be. I think there's, you can just hear it. Now. Get out of the car. Now. So if you haven't heard... Yeah, you should be. What cop says that? That's fucked. There has since been, uh, let me see if I already created this later article as well that was, I thought was interesting. But I think I just talked about it on Twitter. I didn't actually include it in this, which is fine because we're talking about it now. But apparently there was a uh, uh, person... Uh, the head of the, uh, like, the police chief or whatever, uh, made a statement um, saying that the one person was at fault and would get fired, but the other guy wasn't so bad. And I think he was talking about this guy. This guy who was like, if you just work with us and we can talk this through. And then this guy's like, you should be scared and shit. And, and apparently this guy at one point switches out his gun for his taser later. And then after that, apparently even puts that away and tries to de-escalate the situation. So they're trying, uh, the chief is trying to argue that this guy should keep his job. And this guy's the one, the, and this guy's also the newbie. So I guess this guy's the one that's been training this guy. Um, and so like, you know, the guy who was the asshole was the one training the newbie who's just trying to de-escalate. Um, so the argument the leader is making that they both shouldn't necessarily be um, attacked and it should be the guy in charge that should be charged. I think that's possibly a reasonable take. Um, they pepper sprayed him at one point during the uh, during the 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 whole the whole thing. Um, here, I'll just read this. By the end of the incident, the cops would threaten Nazario, pepper spray him in the face, and knee strike him in the legs, according to body camera footage, Nazario's cell phone video, and legal filings. Later, when Nazario was in tears and on the ground of a gas station parking lot, his officers put him in handcuffs. He repeated, this is fucked up. This is fucked up. The officers allegedly told Nazario if he were to complain, they'd charge him with crimes like obstruction, eluding, and assault on a law enforcement officer, potentially destroying his military career. But now Nazario has a lawyer, and he sued the two Windsor police officers, Joe Gutierrez and Daniel Crocker, on April 2nd, alleging violations of his, sec of his constitutional rights under the Fourth and First Amendments. He's a sworn member of the United States Army. He swears an oath to support to defend the Constitution of the United States from all enemies, foreign and domestic, and the way these officers behave, this implicates the oath that he takes. Almost sounds like they're domestic enemies. Arthur said Nazario thinks he was racially profiled. His hope with the lawsuit is to hold the officers accountable and send a message to other law enforcement officers that this type of behavior will not be tolerated. Fair enough. And it goes on, and you can read more of that by checking out the link at patreon.com slash 99geek. Moving on from there. Um, where was I here? Oh, uh, my write-up, by the way, for that article says, It's funny how conservatives keep insisting these are isolated incidents, yet they happen again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And again. Even after you think police should be on their best behavior for even a couple days, so we wouldn't have to keep hearing of new stories of insane police abuse. These are not isolated incidents anymore, or they never were. They definitely never were. This is the answer to that. Uh, leaked chat, moving on from there. Leaked chats show White Lives Matter movement in shambles after Antifa infiltration. Let's check this out. This is a story by Tess Owen on Vice.com on April 9th, 2021. Just days before a series of White Lives Matter rallies were to take place in cities across the U.S., the movement has fallen into shambles after anti-fascists posed as event organizers and lured unsuspecting racists to join several fake Telegram channels. On Thursday, the administrators of the White Lives Matter channels for Seattle and New Jersey suddenly changed their avatar to an Antifa flag, 
and revealed themselves to be a honeypot created to draw extremists to glean information about them. The New York City White Lives Matter channel followed suit. Beautiful. This marks yet another major setback for the White Lives Matter movement, which began organizing the March for White Lives on the encrypted messaging platform last month. Since announcing the IRL rallies, the movement has been plagued with paranoia, intrigue, and infighting, as well as a general lack of interest from prospective attendees. What's more, Vice News has obtained leaked chats from a private White Lives Matter admin channel suggesting that Antifa infiltration at the highest levels was even worse than organizers thought. By Friday morning, White Lives Matter organizers were doing damage control, trying to assure the public all was well ahead of Sunday's big event in cities across the country. To quickly clarify, Antifa did not infiltrate the nation admins. No. They wrote in a statement on a Telegram channel that has over 2,000 subscribers. Antifa infiltrated a small, semi-public chat where people were reminded to keep the content clean on their channel. But some subscribers of the channel didn't know what to believe anymore. Why is this happening? Wrote one user with the handle JD. I'm so fucking sh sick of this shit. Too many damn feds and Antifa sniffing around. Another user with the handle Freedom replied. What an absolute garbage dumpster fire. Another remarked. Optics have also been significant, uh, been a significant hurdle for White Lives Matter protesters. I can't imagine why organizers, sorry, White Lives Matter organizers, can't imagine why, who hope to tap into the influx of normie MAGA supporters on Telegram following the January 6th Capitol riot. They knew that if they wanted to get in any significant numbers for rallies on April 11th, they'd have to broaden their appeal and avoid associating their event with explicitly Nazi or white supremacist content. It's hard to run a White Lives Matter um, event and not have it associated with white supremacy. <laughs> this has been a common goal of several student high white nationalists, good luck with that, in recent years who rely on dog whistles and euphemism to push their ideas mainstream. But subtly, quickly, uh, but subtlety quickly proved to be a steep challenge for White Lives Matter organizers, I'm sure. The Philadelphia White Lives Matter Telegram channel had become particularly problematic as it was quickly swarmed by some users with handles such as Sig Heil and others with Nazi insignia in their avatars. The Philadelphia channel was so extreme that even White Lives Matter Telegram users on other channels raised their eyebrows. Just a recommendation, separate yourself from Philly, one person wrote in the white, main White Lives Matter channel. It is so hateful that it seems like a troll made it. No. You guys are the trolls. You guys just don't even realize. It's insane. The New Jersey European Heritage Association, a white nationalist group that considers itself optic savvy, was even forced put... I mean, they even earlier pointed out that um, the people who... Uh, the Antifa people who infiltrated us, they only got control of a clean board. So if it was a clean board, we know it's absolutely not the board that is so hateful that it seems like trolls made it. <laughs> The New Jersey European Heritage Association, a white nationalist group that considers itself optic savvy, was even forced to put out a statement disavowing the Philadelphia Channel after one of its uh, one of its members was accused of participating. To reiterate, New Jersey European Heritage Association is not or not organizing, participating in, or endorsing any purported White Lives Matter events in Philadelphia. They wrote in a statement on Telegram. In late March, White Lives Matter organizers formed a 14-person private Telegram channel of admins where they could discuss optics. A major concern was trying to beat back some of the more extreme Nazi content on channels specifically organizing upcoming rallies, according to chat logs leaked to Vice News. This event should be 110% optical in the sense of no swastikas or anything that puts normies off. I love how much conservatives insist that they're not the Nazis, that the real Nazis are the liberals. Remember the whole thing with Gina Carano and uh, how she had the whole, like, See, they're just like the Nazis, and this is just as bad as the Nazis, and the liberals are the Nazis, and everybody's all like, they're Nazis, and, uh, and, and, and oftentimes they justify that as, well, you guys call us Nazis, and well, you can call us Nazis, and we can call you the Nazis, and it's both just as ridiculous both ways, and uh, if we keep saying it, then people will believe it, and blah, 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 blah. But the reality is that they literally have to tell their own people, hey, remember, to leave your swastikas at home, 
We don't want people to think we're Nazis. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. And somehow they, people still believe this bullshit. It's unbelievable. It's unimaginable. Another admin with a screen name, Your Fuhrer, chimed in with concerns about some of the violent content that was being distributed in the rally organizing channel. For people not watching the video, I am face bombing. I just... The places so many people draw lines, it's just... It's so baffling. It's sort of like... Did you know that when you're in Windsor and you want to cross to Detroit, apparently you technically have to go north because Detroit is apparently north of Windsor, even though Windsor's in Canada and Detroit is in the US. And that is how I feel sometimes with the logic that these people use. <laughs> just like you're you're trying to go south by going north and I don't understand what you're doing. And it's just it's insane. And I just <laughs> Ah, it's just, it blows my mind. Like, they, they will lean so far fascist in some sense, and then pull back in the randomest places. And it's just like, you've already long gone past into, long gone south into the land of the Nazis. Like, you, <laughs> I don't know why you think drawing the line there somehow makes you, it's just, uh, ay, ay, ay. I, I just, I can't, I can't even, there's more to this article, and I think it could even be worth reading. Um, can I read it? Is it, am I capable of, of reading what more of this stuff says? All right. Maybe. Control myself. Public, sh public shit posting already gives a harmful appeal, but admittedly sending gore to other viewers is going to turn off any person close to joining uh, your Fuhrer wrote. So people who are considering becoming Nazis, and they're like, whoa, too much weird, gross gore and sexual violence and talk about rape stuff and incel stuff and pooping in their hands and eating it and whatever else. Um, but paranoia and arguments got the best of even this small circle of trust. Disputes broke out between purported Proud Boy leader from Michigan and another admin about the fact that Proud Boy's chairman, Enrique Tarrio, is not white. Another user with SS lightning bolts in their screen name urged peace. If you care for our people and don't want us to die, then stop, they wrote. Work together, damn it. Some people of other races want to be racist too. <laughs> Which is just... Concerned about attracting normies to the White Lives Matter movement, extended normies. I love... This whole article extended to the digital presentation of White Lives Matter Telegram users. The Michigan Proud Boy drafted a statement to distribute to various Telegram channels. Remember, if you wish to be taken legitimately and professionally, behave accordingly. It shouldn't have to be said, but if your profile picture has swastikas, iron crosses, or any other symbols that is commonly associated with the Nazi party, uh, consider removing them. But then he got self-conscious. God, this sounds like left-wing sensitivity bullshit dribble, he added. And now they're accusing their own people of being moles and Antifa spies because ex the extreme on one side just can't believe how extreme the other side are about certain matters that they aren't extreme about, but they're but then they're extreme in some ways that these guys aren't extreme about, and it's insane. Like these are just old loonies trying to group together, but they can't do it because they're all just so loony. <laughs> But the real crisis hit on Thursday when members of the White Lives Matter movement began to see the scale of anti-fascist infiltration of the Telegram channels. <gasps> NYC is very likely compromised, one user wrote after the avatar of the White Lives Matter NYC group was changed to the Antifa flag logo. Disgusting, responded your Fuhrer. The White Lives Matter admins began hearing rumors that other channels that had been compromised, Oregon and possibly Pittsburgh, I mean those are cities, but okay. 
As screenshots from the Min channel began to leak online, the Michigan Proud Boy was already feeling the ramifications of his involvement in White Lives Matter and said he was removed from the Proud Boy leadership. Water break. Proud Boy bylaws stipulate that members cannot be neo Nazis or white supremacists. That must be a really hard line to draw. In some cases, violations are. I mean, who does that? Who does that leave? Uh, how does that work? <laughs> I'm so confused. <laughs> does, does anyone meet that? Those. Those. Uh, <laughs> specifications because I find that unlikely. In some cases, violations are handled through Proud Boy courts. Oh, that's exciting. Fine probations and expulsions are all methods of discipline used by the group, but as long as they fight against the liberals doing that sort of thing, apparently. <laughs> what a bunch of insanity. And it just keeps going. <laughs> Here's the last thing but here's the last thing somebody posted. You guys need to all relax. It's not a mess. Us being so paranoid and acting all sketch is only feeding into the public perception that Antifa wants. You're damn right, it's great. They want to portray us as unorganized and messy. And so they are compounding reports about the actually very few regions where the marches are being infiltrated the hardest. So again, they're trying to point out that they're not being infiltrated. This is all them. <laughs> That's just being insane. In reality, the white unity is strong, unified, and honorable. They are using a strategy to overinflate their own messes and using it to try to destroy morale for this movement. I don't think, I don't, good luck proving that. We cannot let them do that to us. Good luck. We are better than that. Take a deep breath. Relax. I'm going dark on this chat after this, but I just wanted to boost your morale and reinstate trust in this movement because this paranoia is playing right into their hands. Keep your head up and the optics in check. Good night. Hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. I love it. Alright, so in some ways, things are going well. But only some ways. Moving on from there. Um, police uh, say that Texas infant was fatally shot by three-year-old brother. This is horrifying. Yet another shooting that could have been avoided with a gun ban, I say. Let's read this for closer details. This is a story by the Associated Press on April 9th, 2021. That's how you write out a date. Um, again, Texas infant fatally shot by three-year-old brother. Police believe an infant was fatally shot Friday by his three-year-old brother after the older brother got hold of a gun inside of a Houston apartment. The infant was shot in his abdomen Friday morning, said Houston Police Department Ass Assistant Chief Wendy Bainbridge. That's horrible. Several adults who were inside the apartment drove the eight-month-old boy to a hospital where he died. I just want to take this moment and plead with parents and guardians all over to not allow your firearms to be accessible to anyone in the house. Lock them up. There are things that you can do to render that weapon safe. Please pray for this family. This is just a tragic event. No, we should have a ban on all fucking guns. People don't need a gun in their house. Investigators initially were not able to locate the gun used in the shooting, but found it later inside the vehicle that family members had used to take the infant to the hospital. Investigators and prosecutors are still determining if any charges will be filed in the case, Bainbridge said. Yes, let's file a... Uh, charge against that three-year-old. Moving on from there, Trump in 2024, he says only that a Republican will win. Um, uh, what? Let's hear a bit more about that. This is a story by the Associated Press, uh, and Steve Peoples of the Associated Press, on April 10th, 2021, uh, at, out of Palm Beach, Florida. Former President Donald Trump plans to affirm his commitment to the Republican Party and raise the possibility that someone else will be the GOP's next presidential nominee in a closed-door speech to donors Saturday night. Trump's message, outlined in prepared remarks obtained by the Associated Press, comes as GOP officials seek to downplay an intra-party feud over Trump's continued leadership in Republican politics. So these people are feuding too. It's so fun. Uh, his, but, and yet they're all convinced that they're going to win. <laughs> they're feuding to the extreme and they can't get their stories straight and they keep getting more and more extreme 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 and yet they are convinced that they are a majority and that they are going to win through democracy it's unimaginable um Trump's message outlined in prepared remarks obtained in the Associated Press comes as GOP officials seek to out downplay an intra-party feud over Trump's continued leadership in Republican uh, politics, his commitment to party fundraising, and his plans for 2024. Trump's advisors report he will emphasize party unity. 
He is famously known to go, uh, while Trump's advisors report he will emphasize party unity, he is famously known to go off script. We are gathered tonight to talk about the future of the Republican Party and what we must do to set our candidates on a course to victory, Trump says in prepared remarks. I stand before you this evening filled with confidence that in 2022 we are going to take back the House and we are going to reclaim the Senate. And then in 2024, a Republican candidate is going to win the White House. The former president will deliver his remarks behind closed doors at his Florida resort Mar-a-Lago in the final address of the Republican National Committee's Weekend Donor Summit in Palm Beach. Most of the RNC's invitation-only weekend gathering was set at a luxury hotel four miles away, but attendees were bussed to Trump's club for his remarks. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is expected to address donors Saturday night as well. Earlier in the weekend, a slew of candidates already positioning themselves for a 2024 presidential run made appearances. Besides DeSantis, the potential White House contenders included South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem and Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy and Senators Rick Scott and Marco Rubio of Florida and Lindsey Graham of South Carolina also spoke. In his remarks Friday night, Cotton leaned into the GOP's culture war, attacking the Democrats' positions on transgender youth, voter ID laws, and Major League Baseball's decision to move its all-star game to protest Republican voting laws, just as Trump does in his prepared remarks. Okay. While a significant faction of the Republican Party hopes to move past Trump's divisive leadership, the location of the weekend gathering suggests that the GOP, at least for now, is not ready to replace Trump as its undisputed leader and chief fundraiser. Trump's team reports that his remarks are intended to reinforce his continued leadership role in Republican affairs, a sharp break from past presidents. Saturday's speech will be, a welcome, will be welcome words to the Republican donors visiting Mar-a-Lago to hear directly from President Trump, Trump advisor Jason Miller said. Palm Beach is a new political power center, and President Trump is the Republican Party's best messenger. Despite Saturday's intended message, Trump's commitment to the GOP is far from certain. Earlier in the year, he raised the possibility of creating a new political party, and just a month ago, Trump's political action committee sent letters to the RNC and others asking to immediately cease and desist on authorized use of President Donald Trump's name, image, and likeness for all fundraising, persuasion, and or issue speech. GOP officials have repeatedly tried to downplay the fundraising tensions and see Trump's participation as a sign that he is willing to lend his name to the party. At the same time, Trump continues to aggressively accumulate campaign cash to fuel his own political ambitions. Trump has also regularly attacked his Republican critics in recent weeks, especially Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and number 3 House Republican Liz Cheney. Neither attended the weekend donor summit. Trump did not attack Cheney or McConnell or any Republicans in Saturday's speech, at least according to his scripted remarks. And that was a story from the Associated Press, to which I say, it's insane to me how more and more people are waking up to how villainous they are. People are flocking from the party in truckloads, and yet they still insist on sticking to the same villainous agenda. It's insanity. It really is. Moving on. Here's how radioactive Fukushima nuclear plant's wastewater is. Uh, this is a story on Vice.com. In that epic 13 month and fourth day in 20, um, I guess that's supposed to be April 13th, 2021. The Japanese government announced on Tuesday its plan to release more than 1.25 million tons of treated. Is that, is that where all that water is being stored? That is insane. Japanese, uh, let's try that again. Sorry, if you're watching the video, there's a funny picture. I wouldn't call that funny, I would call it scary. Uh, the Japanese government announced on Tuesday. It's planned to release more than 1.25 million tons of treated wastewater from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant into the sea. The treated water will contain tritium, a radioactive isotope of the element hydrogen. The plants operated the Tokyo Electric Power Company used the water to cool the plant after it suffered a meltdown in the aftermath of a massive earthquake and tsunami in 2011. But as 1,000 tanks storing the treated wastewater are expected to run out of capacity by the fall of next year, Japan has decided to release it into the Pacific Ocean over decades. Despite opposition from neighboring countries, including South Korea and China, as well as the local fishing industry, the discharge will take two years to prepare, officials have said. Japan has insisted that the concentration of tritium in the treated solution will be so low that it is harmless to people even before it is diluted by the world's largest and deepest ocean. 
The International Atomic Energy Agency has backed Japan's decision, saying that the discharge will pose no health or environmental risks after reviewing the Fukushima power plant. James Konka, an American environmental scientist specializing in the disposal of nuclear waste, called the radiation level of the treated wastewater trivial. The radiation dose from one quart of this water is equal to four bananas, or I didn't know bananas had radiation, or a family-sized bag of potato chips. A ton of this water gives a dose of approximately four MSV, um, millisalvin units, I believe it is. I think that's scalvin or something like that. About the av- about the average annual background dose to everyone in America, and less than a single chest CT scan, which is seven MSV. So you're saying everyone in America apparently gets approximately four MSV average background dose just from everything that exists in America, um, and a CT scan causes seven MSV. Mass Galvin volts. Um, the average dose of natural radiation for a Japanese resident is 2.1 MSV, according to Jap- Japan's Ministry of Environment. So it's lower for Japan than it is for America. Lucky Japan. But those who oppose the dumping believe tritium is dangerous, claiming its, re- its release into the ocean would have an impact on marine life and public health. China has called on Japan to reconsider its plan to release this water. Japan has not exhausted safe disposal methods regardless of domestic and foreign question and opposition, a spokesperson for the Chinese Foreign Ministry said Tuesday. South Korea similarly expressed strong regret over the Japanese government's decision, Yonhap News Agency reported. Tritium is the only radioactive isotope of hydrogen. Like hydrogen, it reacts with ox- oxygen to produce water, also known as tr- tritiated water. It's produced naturally in the upper atmosphere, but can also be made by humans, such as in nuclear reactors and weapons. The element is commonly used in glow-in-the-dark lighting. Research has suggested that tritium is carcinogenic at extremely high levels. That's as high as 37 million BQL. In comparison, tritium in the Fukushima plant's wastewater will be diluted to 60,000 BQL before being released. Humans are exposed to small doses of tritium every day in drinking water and the air. Fear of nuclear contamination following the 2011 Fukushima disaster has hurt the export of food from the prefecture. China is one of at least four countries that have imposed strict regulations on imports of Fukushima food, according to prefectural authorities. The United States, which also supported Japan's decision to release the treated wastewater into the ocean, has continued monitoring agricultural products in Fukushima, including milk, vegetables, rice, for contamination. Why are we importing? I feel like Japan's so small, shouldn't they just be feeding their own people with their farming stuff? Am I crazy? Regardless of whether the discharge will have a harmful effect on people or marine life, Fukushima's fishermen are protesting the government's decision, fearing that the release could tarnish their fishing product's reputation. Moving on from there. Uh, What I said, uh, my write-up for that, just more proof to me why the act of swimming is never again going to be a thing in my life. There are many proofs that just don't swim anymore just don't don't learn how to swim there's no point because um that's how the parasites will get you and if the parasites don't get you then the pollution will uh that said the end of this article has interesting statistics that said the end of this article has interesting statistics about the radiation level of this radiated water not that high how much radiation is already in our drinking water higher than you'd think so yeah we learned interesting things from that article. Moving on. These Chinese women vow never to marry or have sex with men. Then censors stepped in. That's a story by Viola Zhu on April 14th, 2021. A small fringe group of feminists in China faces a crackdown. In a country famous for censorship, they talk freely of fighting the patriarchy. They questioned everyday sexism at workplaces and in mass media. They promised never to marry men or sleep with them, let alone bearing their children. The group of women on the fringes of China's nascent feminist movement had for years been able to have unfettered discussions on Duban, a book and movie review site that doubles as a message board for mostly young, educated Chinese internet users. That's sweet. And I'm glad that they were able to, that I think they should, like, they are going through a lot right now in that country and they should have the opportunity to say fuck it all. But for some of the country's feminists, the good times may soon be over. 
This week, several popular feminist groups were abruptly shut down. Many of the groups had members who adhered to an idea known as 6B4T, which, re which originated from so South Korea's radical feminine movement and rejects heterosexual sex, marriage, and child rearing. To evade oppression by the male-dominated society, 6B4T also encourages women to abandon tight-fitting dresses, religions, and idols. In screenshots shared online, Dubin told administrators of the banned groups that the forums contained extremism, radical politics, and ideologies. Yes, it's so radical to not want to have sex with men. On Tuesday, users were also banned from posting the phrase 6B4T on the site's public message board. Dubon did not respond to a request for comments. While the vows against sex and marriage have gained little mainstream traction, the closure of the groups have prompted an outcry among female internet users. On the microblogging site Weibo, many women said the radical feminists deserve to be heard, even though they did not agree with the beliefs. Cindy, a 21-year-old student in the central province of Henan who declined to give her full name, said she visited two of the now-closed groups almost every day to read about gender discrimination and the fight for equality. One group had more, and it must be so horrible to tell stories about things that are happening to you. What extreme people these are. Uh, one group had more than 40,000 members. She said she would like to stay single, citing posts she read on Dubon for society's exploitation of women. I think this is a way to tell men that women can live in a world without them, she told Vice World News. As long as the feminist fighters are here, we will be able to find new spaces. Jio Griana Lee, a 24-year-old translator in Guangdong, said she would visit the Duban groups to read about other struggles in male-dominated society, and the crackdown has demonstrated how conservative China is, in the worst way. 6B4T is a passive way of resistance and self-protection under the current gender equality situation in East Asia, she said, adding she has no immediate plan to date or get married. Gender discrimination is prevalent in China, but compared with other political topics, gender issues are generally allowed more space for discussions on the tightly controlled internet. Intense arguments often break out between young feminists and men who accuse them of being corrupted by Western values, often using misogynistic language. Zailing Zi, a researcher on gender and politics at the University of Warwick, said although authorities had traditionally seen feminist movements as trivial and less threatening than other kinds of activism, the growing voices from young educated women are coming under more official scrutiny. Basically, they figured that women weren't strong enough or uh, mattered enough for them to care about their activism, but now their voices are getting too loud, and so they must step in. China's governing model is still pretty much relying upon heterosexual marriages as a stabilizer, Z said. These feminist groups, especially the ones against marriage, against childbirth, are touching the nerves of the fundamental governing structure. The Communist Party leadership, which places great emphasis on stable families, has recently made divorce more difficult to protect marriages. That's awful, because a lot of those people are in abusive relationships. China's plummeting birth rates have led to worries about among feminists that the government will step up eff efforts to push women into having children. Ooh, I cannot. I really don't want to imagine what that's going to be like. But that sounds horrifying. And women should leave in vast numbers. They should just get the fuck out of China. Moving on from there. Um, or let's read the what I wrote about that. No, I've already said all that. Moving on from there, hospital, Niger Elementary School fire kills 20 children. This is just horrible. This is a story um, by the Associated Press, uh, by Dalatu Mamain of the Associated Press, out of Niame, Niger, on April 14th, 2021. A fire fueled by high winds swept through an elementary school in Niger's capital, killing 20 children, hospital officials said Wednesday. The pupils, between the ages of 7 and 13, were attending class at the time the blaze erupted around 4.30 p.m. on Tuesday. The cause of the fire was under investigation. It was not immediately known where it started. Some of the school's classrooms were inside buildings, though other classes were held outside in straw huts. Prime Minister Umudu Mahamadu and Interior Minister Al-Kashe al, al uh, visited the scene and gave the condolences to the grieving families. That is a horrible, quick story. I, what I find most horrible from that story, I quickly say, those poor children, can you imagine, not just those poor children and the horrible way that they died, but can you imagine the people who survived and have to survive remembering the screams of all those poor children? I can't even imagine. I can't imagine what it sounded like or smelt like or 
what it felt like for those kids that that's a nightmare story is what that is those poor people and i i didn't hear that anywhere else so uh thank god for the associated press and thank god i managed to catch that story that's out of niger moving on from there republicans are making millions pushing trump's election lies this is a story from uh, vice.com by cameron joseph on april 14th 2021 the politicians who bet big on backing President Trump's election lies are raking in the benefits. Texas GOP Senator Ted Cruz announced Tuesday that he'd raised $5.3 million in the first three, first three months of this year. Holy shit. A massive sum for a senator who isn't up for re-election until 2024. So he's not even, there's, no, there's nothing, he's not raising money for anything in particular. But he's raised $5.3 million. Missouri GOP Senator Josh Howley raised $3 million during the same stretch. His team leaked on Monday. That figure likely would have been, and everybody hates Ted Cruz, sorry. That figure likely would have been even higher if he hadn't paused active fundraising for three weeks in the immediate aftermath of the January 6th pro-Trump insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. That stretch brought in 600000 The senators have three things in common. They're both eyeing potential presidential bids in four years. Well, with those numbers, I'll see if they could get it. They're Ivy League trained lawyers who, but also I would love to see Ted Cruz against anyone. Ted Cruz versus Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Let's go, 2024. Amazing. Uh, they're Ivy League trained lawyers who rebranded themselves as anti elite populists, but it's bullshit. And most importantly, they led the charge in the Senate to block the certification of President Trump, uh, Biden's victory right after the insurrection, a transparent move to curry favor with Trump supporters, which they refused to back off even after Trump followers violently stormed the Capitol in an attempt to stop the proceedings in their tracks. Their strong fundraising hauls showed their anti-democratic marketing poise worked, but their numbers would look even more impressive if freshman rep uh, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene hadn't raised a staggering $3.2 million from 100,000 separate donors during the same period. She certainly doesn't need the money. She's in one of the safest seats in the country. But she used the outrage over remarks in which she promoted violence, spouted anti-Semitism, and embraced QAnon to scream that Democrats were canceling her by removing her from her committee assignments, and it paid off. Green was explicit in explaining how she did so well, saying she was because uh, saying it was because she stood my ground and never stood my ground and never wavered in my belief in America First policies, while promising to never back down. Um, in her tweet, I am humbled, overjoyed, and so excited to announce what happened over the past few months since I have been the most attacked freshman member of Congress in history. Over 100,000 donors poured in over 3,200,000 to support me, averaging $30 per dollars per donation. Home. Oh, oh, boy. Oh, oh. You know what? We don't know what because they didn't post the rest of that tweet. Uh, she's right about the GOP's base of political motivations. Cruz and Hawley probably wouldn't love to be lumped in with Green. She's a fringe figure even in their eyes, while they see themselves as serious senators with legitimate bids to be president, but their methods weren't all that different. The three lawmakers are among the GOP's best practitioners at producing outrage porn, trolling the libs, and bear-hugging President Trump in order to get ahead. Green's particularly strong haul shows that there's almost no limit to how far you can go in the GOP in terms of fundraising. Any backlash will only fuel further fundraising. That's why it shouldn't be so surprising that Florida GOP Representative Matt Gates, one of Trump's loudest lackeys, has kept fundraising throughout his ongoing sex trafficking investigation, using the attacks against him as fodder for his fundraising emails. Isn't that great? So they claim to be obsessed with stopping the sex trafficking and the sex predators in politics. And yet, when we find one, they support him with more money. It also explains why the National Republican Senatorial Committee made up a new Freedom Award to give Trump last weekend. He got a Freedom Award! Isn't that adorable? And why many GOP senators shrugged when Trump used his speech the next night to call Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell a dumb son of a bitch. And it explains why the National Republican Congressional Committee posted an impressive fundraising quarter even though a majority of its members and most of House GOP leadership voted against certifying Biden's election victory, even after pro-Trump rioters tore the building apart. 
Trump has successfully convinced the majority of the Republican Party that Democrats stole the election from him with rampant voter fraud, and they're looking to back people who fought back hard against the, this supposed completely unsubstantiated steal. Steal. Firebrands have long been successful fundraisers in the GOP, and in the Trump era, that meant embracing the president and his harshest rhetoric. Trump's own massive fundraising and political success proved this, and down and down ticket Republicans were happy to successfully steal this playbook. The biggest House GOP fundraisers last cycle who weren't in leadership were Representative Devin Nunes of California, Dan Crenshaw of Texas, Jim Jordan of Ohio, and Lisa Stefanik of New York. Nunes and Jordan have been two of the House's loudest Trump boosters, while Stefanik built her national profile by defending Trump against impeachment. Crenshaw also delights in trolling the libs, and while he's criticized Trump some, most of it happened after the election. The top Senate GOP fundraiser last cycle was South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham, whose pugnacious Trump, a pro-Trump fealty helped him raise more than $100 million in his re-election battle. A hundred million dollars for what? How is there no limit? How is there no fucking limit? What the fuck? A hundred million dollars. That's fucking Hollywood money. What the fuck is going on here? Plenty of lawmakers haven't reported their quarterly fundraising hauls yet, and being controversial isn't alone enough to become a fundraising superstar. Colorado GOP Representative Lauren Boebert raised $700,000 in the past quarter, a strong if not overwhelming amount for a freshman in a marginally competitive district. But her top Democratic opponent brought in $640,000, showing being a lightning rod has its pluses and minuses and can spur fundraising against you just as easily. But the fundraising success crews Howley and Green achieved in the wake of their embrace of the lie that the 2020 presidential election was rife with voter fraud shows that the GOP base will only reward such behavior, and it clearly illustrates the dangerous political and financial incentives that currently power the Republican Party. There should be a limit to how much people are allowed to, to bring in for the party, and everything else should go towards uh, charities. Charities of the current administration season as well might I add, so they don't all go to the Trump charity, he just gets the money for himself to build statues. Um, I think the takeaway from this I write later is how much the Republicans continue to entrench themselves in their conspiracy and false reality and somehow keep getting stronger for it. Also, they awarded Trump an award for freedom, like what? But seriously, like a lot of that is really scary, uh, especially how much money they're making and the fact they can use that money to further manipulate and fool people into believing the lies that they continue to push. And people keep thinking it's over and that we've won, but we've not won. Like, the battle just keeps going and going and going, and it never it never ends. The price of freedom is eternal vigilance. That's what I'm saying, and that's what I've always said, because I played my commander for at a young age. Um, a radical political party unleashed violence in Pakistan. These women stood up to them. This is a fun story. So let's hear this. I'm so hungry. You guys have no idea. I haven't eaten yet today. It is now what time? 3.23. How long have we been going for? An hour and 37 minutes. This is fun. All right. Um, this is a story by Pallavi Pundir um, out of Delhi, India. Uh, and that's for vice.com on April 15th, 2021. Again, they wrote the date wrong because they suck. Members of the far-right political party Tariq e Labaik, uh, Pakistan, the TLP, held several cities hostage since they launched violent protests across Pakistan on Monday night, April 12th. The TLP, known for fanning blasphemy-related outrage, is a relatively new registered political party in contest elections. Two cops were killed and more than 300 law enforcement personnel were injured before the government started arresting members of the group. As of April 15th, 1,400 members of the TLP have been arrested and the government has started the process of banning TLP through anti-terrorism laws. Huh. They're calling that anti-terrorism? I mean, yes, that is anti-terrorism. Uh, because... I mean, yes, that is terrorism because... They, uh, sorry, I misread that. Uh, I thought they were saying... Uh, yes, okay. Yes, I thought they were saying that the TLP were anti-terrorists. My mistake. Um, yes, they are uh, causing violent protests um, and the government has been arresting members 
Before the government started cracking down on the party, two videos of women confronting protesters went viral in Pakistan. In one video, a female dentist named Barira Bukhari is seen shouting at protesters who had blocked the main road in Pakistan's capital, Islamabad. According to Bukhari, she was trying to clear the path for an ambulance carrying critical patients. We don't know what they're saying, so let's help. Um, let's talk on the side, a man said in a video. I mean, I don't know if they're... They say that the, the group is violent. Um, and I don't know if these anti-terrorist crackdowns are good or not, because, and this woman is, apparently got mad at them, but like, for instance, this line, this talk on the side, a man said in the video, uh, so he just wanted to talk. My shoe will talk to you. Okay, never mind. Oh, no, that's what she said. Uh, my shoe will talk to you on the side, Bukhari snapped back. This man has been threatening me. Sir, please tell me your name. As startled men grappled with the response, they started clearing the path of the ambulance and Bukhari to pass. The next time you try to block my way home for my sick mother, I'll kick your asses over a thousand times again, Bukhari wrote. I mean, it's just, she just speaking out against, I appreciate it. Like, yeah, you came to fight for the Prophet Muhammad, hypocrites. He would be ashamed of you, leaving people to die in ambulances on the street. Oops. Oops. I accidentally clicked something. Um, yes, that is bad. Uh, the TLP protests erupted following the arrest of the 26-year-old leader, Saad Hussein Rizvi. He was arrested by the police as a preemptive measure after he threatened protests of the government uh, if the government did not expel the French ambassador to Pakistan from the country. TLP party workers started blocking rail tracks, highways, and entry and exit points to all major cities on April 12th. That is pretty extreme. Um, social media videos showed protesters beating up police officers and vandalizing a hospital in Lahore. So it is worse than saying. I mean, I would say that what we're seeing here looks somewhat similar to like insurrection level violence. Then I guess the question some people would have is what makes that difference from the BLM protests. And I just want to say definitively. What that is, uh, video. I want to footage around the world. This could be interesting. So let's compare that to this. Are they blocking all major roads in a city? Uh, what's that right footage? It's And names. Oh. It's a march. And they're not being violent. They're standing. Dancing. Wow, a lot of dancing. Look at all those people dancing. A lot of dancing. Wow. What was that about? That was interesting. And they wrote that on the on the street, which is cool. Wait, where was that? Was that? Oh, that was Washington D.C. Wow, that's cool. They tried something similar uh, in my city in Hamilton. So, like, the idea that the Black Lives Matter is they're the terrorists, you know, that's bullshit. What a bunch of bullshit. You compare that to this. Somebody says, I don't see how there's any space that would be for it in this abyss. As violence escalated, evidenced by the flood of visuals from the ground, the Pakistani government, which had not reacted to the violence since it broke, announced on April 14th that it will ban the outfit. The federal government has decided to ban Tariq e Lebek under the Anti-Terrorism Act. Pakistani's Interior Minister Sheikh Rashid Ahmed announced on Twitter. Before the ban announcement, another video emerged of an unidentified woman confronting TLP workers who had blocked the road to her home in Lahore. Ap Sab Bahar Main Gai, you all go to hell, she told a group of men holding sticks. 
She continues in Urdu, people who block the road for regular people in the name of religion will go to hell. Then she is seen moving to her car, telling her male companion to drive through the barricade even if they break their windows. Do it or let me drive, she says. Good job. Oh, women taking the onus of confronting the TLP workers are being lauded for exceptional bravery. These women are telling us how to fight this shameless anarchy, said one comment. While another said, this woman has more courage than our government, who couldn't control these so-called saviors of Islam. So I guess they're rel religious extremists who are doing these um, this violence. Uh, overwhelmed by all the sport, love and support I'm getting for simply clearing a route for an ambulance, stated the, the girl who started all this, who did not respond to an interview request from Vice. The two viral videos show how citizens were forced to take control while police officers were tweeting their frustration at having to bear the brunt of the violence. Pakistani media also reported that TLP workers used guns, assaulted, and kidnapped the cops. Local news outlets reported incidents of TLP workers forcing a police officer with a bloodied face to frog march on the street. See? BLM definitely never did that. That's fucked. The government's slow response to the violence is being criticized by analysts and journalists. The government waited and waited for the TLP cut to uh, waited and waited as the TLP cut off motorways, blocked highways. I mean, that's pretty insane, right? Like BLM never did any of that. It was a march that moved, so it didn't cut off any particular area for any particular long length of time. <laughs> um, they thrashed and even killed policemen. Holy shit! And held normalcy hostage. For three days, yes, the government waited and watched and stayed silent. Even the most voluble brigade of... See, if they had led with all this, I wouldn't have started with... Which side am I supposed to take on this issue? <laughs> um, That's horrible. Uh, TLP protesters attacked General Hospital in Lahore. What? Police had to run inside the hospital to protect themselves. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister seems to have forgotten he's supposed to actually be dealing with this stuff and protecting the police force, which is literally being lynched. They're being lynched? The TLP had famously denounced French President Emmanuel Macron last year after the French leader defended caricatures of Prophet Muhammad. Depiction of Prophet Muhammad is blasphemous in Pakistan, a crime that is punishable by death once convicted. The TLP has been using blasphemy as a rallying point. You're kidding. So that's what this is all about? Studies show that many blasphemy allegations are a result of a personal feud or grudge. Mere accusations can endanger a person's life. TLP's RISB's supporters previously held violent protests so that the government does not repeal the country's controversial blasphemy laws. Jesus Christ. The French embassy asks its citizens to leave Pakistan, the embassy to stay open and functional media reports. Last year, uh, that was a tweet. Uh, last year, the group def uh, ended anti-France protests uh, after the government signaled a deal agreeing to support a boycott of French products. The government had also agreed to make a parliamentary move to expel the French ambassador. This is insane. How is it that so many people are able to just whip the whole country up into a frenzy like that? Just because, what? They uh, showed uh, the Prophet Muhammad in one of their comedy programs. How dare they? That's blasphemy. War. We must have war. Death to all French people or whoever it is. America, whatever. Like, it's insane that they are that over the top about this issue. And that is absolutely extremism. And absolutely needs to be stopped. Now, what's crazy is I have heard nothing about the, any of that violence from anything else until that article. So uh, hopefully that gets that information out to more people because it's crazy that that violence is going on. Moving on from there to how many, we have three more stories left. Global warming's extreme rains threaten Hawaii's coral reefs. Um, I didn't. Uh, you can read the article if you want to, but what I found interesting in this article was how much wastewater ends up in the oceans just from one town. They talk about like uh, something like multiple three Olympic sized pools of waste of like poop water, sewage water is, is entering the ocean every day or something like that from this one town in Hawaii. And it's and meanwhile, they're worried about um, Japan uh, and their slightly irradiated water. That's kind of crazy. Uh, while other people are dumping shit and companies and factories just dump chemicals and waste and garbage and whatever else. You know that Trump reversed the U.S. water protections during his presidency, allowing companies to dump in oceans and even drinking water because, I mean, who gives a shit? He guaranteed with one of his executive orders that Flinch, Michigan would happen again. 
Yes, it's probably been reversed by Biden, fingers crossed, but the fact anyone still defends and supports these people blows my goddamn mind. Um, and how I, I may should turn from that back to, but I mean, uh, back to Trump is amazing. But I mean, again, when he reversals water protections, I couldn't believe it. Like, who does that? Like, the, You might as well just be twisting your evil little mustache. It's been insane. Moving on from there to a study. About 2.5 billion uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex dinosaurs roam the Earth, but not all at once. That's just in total. Just like they say over 100 billion humans existed in the history of mankind or whatever. Um, apparently, two, around 2.5 billion T-Rex roam the Earth. But that is an estimate. Um, reading the article, and I won't read it here, but reading the article, apparently um, their um, error uh, quotient, their uh, ratio, their, their min-max, their upper-lower um, limits uh, to this estimate, are their, or let's just say their estimated ratio is somewhere between 140 million to 42 billion. It's a huge difference. And then they took those numbers and they're like, well, 2.5 billion is in the middle of that. So we'll just say that it's 2.5 billion. And it's like, that's not science. What the fuck? <laughs> so I don't know how serious this article is. But uh, they say somewhere around 2.5, somewhere between 140 million and 42 billion uh, Taiwan's first Rexes at one point roamed the Earth, which is a kind of cool statistic. Um, they, uh, what is pointed out by that number, apparently, is the fact that not many of those survived. Like, we only have 30-some-odd skeletons of T-Rexes alive today, um, which goes to suggest that um, uh, if there really were that many in all of history, then most skeletons do not get pres preserved. And um, that's crazy how few <laughs> then. Moving on from there is what people were saying. Moving on from there, GOP leaders diverge on Trump, putting party in limbo. Finally, this is our last story. Let's hear what this is all about, shall we? This is a story by the Associated Press on April 16, 2021 by Lisa Mascaro out of Washington. One by one, the Republican leaders of Congress have made the trip to Mar-a-Lago to see Donald Trump. Isn't that horrifying? Kevin McCarthy visited after the deadly January 6th Capitol insurrection, counting on the former president's help to win back control of the House in 2022. Good luck with that. The chair of the Senate Republican Campaign Committee, Rick Scott, stopped by to enlist Trump in efforts to regain the Senate. Lindsey Graham goes to... Oh, to regain the Senate. Period. Lindsey Graham goes to play golf regularly. Well, that's dumb. Not missing from the appearances has been perhaps the most powerful Republican elected official in the country, Mitch McConnell, a one-time ally who ushered the former president's legislative and judicial agenda to fruition, but now claims to want nothing to do with Trump. Very public pilgrimages and the noticeable refusal to make one have placed congressional Republicans at a crossroads, with one branch of the party keeping close to Trump, hoping to harness the power of his political brand and loyal voters for their campaigns, and the other splitting away, trying to chart the GOP's post-Trump future. With no obvious heir, parent, or leader in waiting, the standoff between the party's two highest-ranking figures poses an uneasy test of political wills and loyalties, particularly for the rank-and-file lawmakers in Congress dependent on both men for their political livelihoods. Congress has become more Trump-like in the former president's absence as the new generation of Trump-aligned law lawmakers emerges, particularly in the Senate, and more centrist Republicans announce their retirements. We've got enough problems without, without fighting within ourselves, says Senator Tommy Tuberville from Republican Alabama, who was swept into office this year with Trump's support. You know, being a football coach... That's what I would tell our players and coaches, he said. You bring your whole team down. That's pretty much how I think about this. As a team, we need arguing. We don't need arguing between teammates. We just need them to be on the same page. The stark fallout was on display at the Republican donor retreat when Trump lashed into McConnell as a stone-cold loser, but then was feted with an honorary award from Scott, the National Republican Senatorial Committee chair launching the campaign efforts. Asked about it later, McConnell responded with perhaps the most cutting retort of all. He simply ignored Trump. I'm, I'm concentrating on what I'm concentrating on is the future, said McConnell, the Senate Republican leader. 
Unlike past presidents who did not win a second term, the end of Trump's presidency has not brought closure as much as it has a lingering uncertainty on Capitol Hill about the party's pathway back to power. He is promising to return to the political stage, perhaps for his own bid for the White House. But more immediately, he is being enlisted by GOP leaders in support of congressional candidates to win back the House and the Senate. As McConnell tries to position Republicans against the opposition to... Uh, as McConnell tries to position Republicans as the opposition to President Joe Biden's agenda, it is clear that while he is the leader of the Senate, Trump remains for now the leader of the GOP. Is it ideal? I don't know, but is it sustainable? Sure, said Scott Denning, the GOP strategist and longtime McConnell confident. It's easy to see how they both could frankly be successful in their individual goals without ever speaking another word to each other. Denning said McConnell and Trump aren't jockeying for power as much as bringing complementary skills to the campaigns ahead. The former president can rev up his base of supporters with rally-style speeches, while McConnell can assemble the campaign strategies and candidates to re regain control of the Senate. One of them is in party-building mode, which is McConnell, and the other one is in axe-grinding mode, he said. They don't have to be golfing buddies, he said. The congressional leaders want and expect Trump to play a role in the next year's midterms elections as they try to wrest control from Democrats with the slimmest majority in the House and the Senate in recent memories. God, I hope it goes completely against what they want, and... Um, that they instead Democrats gain even more control as people flock wildly away from the insanity of the Republicans. God, yes, uh, Graham uh, said recently. He is sitting on a mountain of money and has a ninety percent approval rating among Republicans. He's just crying because I've seen him cry over the dumbest things. McCarthy and the House Republican leader said Trump has been helpful so far in House GOP campaign efforts. Like all the former presidents, they help. They're engaged in many different ways, McCarthy said. Yet as Trump assembles a political operation from his private club in Florida, his biggest priority so far appears to be trying to defeat some of the party's most prominent lawmakers, including Alaska Senate uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski and Wyoming Representative Liz Cheney, who were among those voting to impeach him over the January 6th insurrection, because... God damn, if people will try, if people are not in our party try to act sane and like reasonable human beings and make choices that would be sane and rational and do their jobs, people who do that must be defeated at all costs and removed from the political, from the conservative party because conservatives must only be irrational and insane at all times and must only lie out of their ass. And if they try to put their faith in truth, then for fuck's sake, get him out of the party, is exactly what this is saying right now. While Trump has also endorsed some GOP incumbents, other Republican lawmakers, particularly in the Senate, have simply announced they are retiring. Asked specifically if Trump should quit attacking the Republican Party's leaders, McCarthy demurred. Um, the number one thing I want to have happen is make sure the next century is the American century, he said. If the next century is going to be ours, we're going to have to change administrations. We're going to have to change Congress. That's my focus. What a bunch of bunch of fucking bullshit! This idea that uh, the Democrats aren't American, that the Americans are only the Republicans, the extreme Republicans at that. What a bunch of fucking bullshit! I hate it so much. McCarthy can go to hell. The whole party should be disbanded. They are terrorists in themselves. I hate them. I hate them. The deadly riot has become a political line of demarcation on Capitol Hill over those GOP lawmakers who stood with Trump to overturn Biden's victory during the Electoral College tally. Uh, Trump was impeached for inciting the insurrection as he urged mo a mob of supporters to fight like hell for his presidency. One of the lawmakers Trump recently endorsed is Alabama GOP Representative Mo Brooks, who is running for the Senate seat that will be vacant with the retirement of longtime GOP Senator Richard Shelby. Brooks has been a leader of the House efforts to challenge the election results and join the rally outside the White House on January 6th. Trump encouraged the mob that day to head to the Capitol. Five people died, including a Trump supporter shot by police and a police officer who died later after fighting the mob of Trump loyalists who stormed the Capitol. At a dinner last month at Mar-a-Lago, Scott said he encouraged the president's support to win back the Senate after the primaries are settled. Many Republicans call recall the 2010 election when they won back control of the House, but not the Senate. Because some of the candidates who won primary elections on the Tea Party wave were too conservative or hardline to appeal to voters statewide. Shelby said he, he wished the former president McConnell would put their differences aside, minding President Ronald Reagan's admonition not to battle each other. 
Republicans fighting Republicans benefits who? The Democrats, said Shelby, which is great. And I like it, so keep doing that. I wish he'd stay out of all the Senate races, but he's not, Shelby said, about Trump. He's got a lot of energy. He's got a dedicated following. I don't think he's looking for retirement. As the Republicans say to Trump all the time, We like what you've got. Show us what you've got. Uh, moving on to the Geekly blog. I have gone over two weeks now without smoking a cigarette, which I'm pretty proud of. Not that the temptation is gone. Pretty much every night before I go to bed is when I feel the worst. I feel it when I feel it the worst. I've just been trying to keep myself distracted. Like, I know last night I was just like, I wanted a cigarette so bad. I came so close to breaking. And I was like, no, don't do it. I did manage to sit down and focus long enough this week to finally file my taxes, and I declared my laptop for my self-employment, which is fair considering how important it is to making this site and my writing work each week. And I should be getting nearly a thousand bucks back, so I'm excited for that. I could really use the money. Maybe I'll finally get an Xbox Series X, which would be nice because my Xbox One keeps overheating, like constantly, like every 20 minutes or so. It's making it impossible to stream. But I'm so broke right now. I hope I get my tax return soon. Moving on from there to the Geeky Weekly comments and questions and stats. Seriously, people, if you had questions about news or politics or entertainment, pop culture, you could ask it, and I would answer here. If people would just engage with this show, then it could grow. Seriously, people, engage, make it so. No, I'm not doing my Picard impression. Number one. My name is Andrew Getzi, and my brand is 99% Geek, found at 99geek.ca. I'm a writer, writing monthly chapters of novels like episodes of TV shows, releasing them in four weekly segments, a teaser and three acts on Sundays on my Patreon page. Every month, it's a different book over a range of genres, and they sometimes even cross over and connect. At the end of the month, the finished chapter is added to the PDFs attached at the bottom of every post. Finally, the finished books are self-published on Amazon. There's urban fantasy stories about uh, there's a dark sorry there's a dark fantasy story about a post-apocalyptic world where powerful royals rule and save the remaining people struggling to survive on the last remaining landmass. There's also a sci-fi story about a people on a dying world who have built a ship to a new one, but the project is almost brought down by a terrorist organization within their own ranks called QAnon. No, I'm kidding. Finally, there's a crossover story where characters from my other books are brought into the distant future where the princess of a far advanced civilization, one that lives in a solar system sized megastructure around a Dyson sphere, needs help defeating her twisted power hungry brother. And all these stories will be outside the paywall for all to enjoy as new episodes release weekly and the finished chapters will be attached to the bottom of every post on the site in convenient PDF format, readable on computers, tablets, e computers, tablets, ebook readers, and phones at the end of the month. But that's not all my stories. There's also urban fantasy tales about a teenage girl turned into a vampire against her will. Or a scorned lover investigating paranormal phenomena. Or a journalist covering news and politics in the Middle East. And there's a fantasy story about a fallen angel trying to stop the end of the world. All these stories are published and available on Amazon and are also safe and sound behind the paywall in the PDF format attached to an archive at the top of the, my Patreon page. Only viewable by subscribers, my entire, library, my entire library of work, thousands of pages worth, is easily accessible to every subscriber at any level. I'd also like to add that you sh can and should review my books if you've read them um, or listened to the podcast or anything like that. They are now on, I made sure that all the books are available on Goodreads, so you can review them on Goodreads even if you haven't been able to review them on Amazon because maybe you don't own the books on Amazon. But if you don't get them on Amazon but you have um, enjoyed my stories in whatever capacity you've enjoyed them, you can post reviews for those stories on Goodreads and that would go a long way to helping people find and, and uh, discover my work. Um, among other great ways to discover my work, including, of course, um, donating a dollar uh, if you subscribe to my Patreon. Um, let me talk more about that. <laughs> Instead of um, making it up as I go. It's literally written about here. Um, but yes, uh, all these stories are published and available on Amazon are also safe and sound behind the paywall in PDF format attached to an archive at the top of my Patreon page. Only viewable by subscribers, my entire library of work, thousands of pages worth, is easily accessible to every subscriber at any level. There is even a Geekly Weekly blog which covers all the news you may have missed over the week as well as ranks a week's worth of television and makes predictions on what new pop culture things might be in the public consciousness for the next week. Finally, I do video game streams, both multiplayer matchmaking as well as single player campaign playthroughs. You can see me play games like Final Fantasy, Call of Duty, Hitman, and more. You can see it all in one place. So stay tuned and maybe subscribe. It's only a dollar and the sporty show will go a very long way, I promise. There are also higher tiers. Give five dollars one month and you can name a character or location or suggest a thing you might want to see. Basically, you get to give a noun and then I promise to incorporate that noun into one of my stories somehow. 
Maybe not the same month you give the suggestion, but within three months guaranteed. No matter how crazy, you can't sabotage me, I promise. Think of it like a fun improv game. You can keep giving nouns for every month you pay at the $5 tier. Or if you give $10, you don't get two nouns, but you can give a description to go with your noun. Describe the personality of your character, or the look of your location, or the importance of your item. For $10, you get a noun and a description. You also give a dollar towards supporting my, video, uh, my efforts at video game streaming, or my weekly blog if that's more where your interests lie. Now people, there are people out there listening to this, and there are hits on my website. I get like 30 hits a day. Come on people. I get like 100 downloads of the podcast today. Come on, people. Subscribe. It's just $1. For just $1, you can show your support and show that you're out there. It would mean so much to me. Even if you think that $1 won't do anything to help me. Even if you think that $1 won't be able to feed me because I'm starving right now. I think about the fact that if you give $1, maybe somebody else will say, wow, now he's got three people giving a dollar. Maybe he's pretty cool. Maybe I'll give a dollar. And maybe somebody else will say, wow, four people is the threshold to which I feel like I can give a dollar. I want to give a dollar too. You know, like by giving a dollar, you let other people know that it's okay to give money as well. And that I'm not just, and that maybe those two people that gave so far aren't just like random people, my mom and my dad or something like that, which they're not. They're just random people on the internet. Um, even though I don't think either of them enjoy my writing, like I, I think they subscribe for different reasons. They're fans of other aspects of what I do. Um, I would love if people who are fans of my writing were to subscribe. I would love if people who are fans of this blog were to subscribe and, and let that be known so that I know you're out there. Even if you have, don't have questions to ask, but if you have questions to ask, that'd be cool too. And then I could answer those questions on the podcast, uh, in the blog. It would be great. Um, but until then I'm as poor as it gets living paycheck to paycheck and sometimes starving. So I understand if you are too. I don't want to take food out of your mouth. Your attention is enough. Say something. Comment here. At the very least, follow me on Twitter at Andrew Getze or Instagram at Commander 4 Live long and prosper. May the force be with you. Long live Marceline the Vampire Queen. Remember, Kong bows to no one, but Godzilla is the king of all monsters. We are the 99% geek.